So we're very, very delighted um, to welcome Manisha Snoyer, who is the founder and CEO of Tutora. Congratulations. And um, over the past 18 years, she's taught over 2,000 students in three countries. Uh, in Paris, San Francisco, and New York. She's worked with students from ages zero years old to 83 in 18 different subjects at many of the top private schools, including uh, the Lycée Français de New York, um, Trinity, Spence, and the American High School in Paris. And during the, the pandemic, uh, Manisha form founded a nonprofit uh, that provides free tutoring to underserved youth. So if you're interested in checking that out, do masteryhour.org um, and led the largest network of organizations supporting families impacted by school closures, serving over 100,000 families. Congratulations and thank you. Um, amazing. And thank you also for working with uh, many of our students. And finally, Manisha is also an award winning translator of contemporary French theatre. So there is nothing that she cannot do. And we're very happy to have her here to talk about um, exam anxiety and how uh, to ensure that your child excel uh, in exams. Thank you, Manisha. Thank you so much, Anneli, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much for everyone who came today. I am really excited to be offering this workshop. Um, in addition to having taught for nearly 20 years, I would like to add that I think that my biggest qualification for giving this workshop is that I am someone who struggled an enormous amount with test and anxiety as a high school student. And I think it often led me to get poor results on my exams and often made me feel sort of an imposter syndrome that I knew I knew the material and I was working harder than all the other kids in the class, but I couldn't seem to you know, do well on these exams. And even throughout my adult life, having to fundraise for my nonprofit and the startups I've run, I've really had to learn the skill of integrating my anxiety. And so I believe that we actually heal best where we're wounded. And so it's really exciting for me to share some of what I've learned and how I've grown and how I work with students with you. And so without further ado, this is a, uh, a workshop about test anxiety, how to overcome test anxiety, um, how to support your, your students in overcoming test anxiety so they can really reach their full potential in school. And so before we talk about how to help your student overcome test anxiety, I think we need to address the elephant in the room, which is that many parents of teens have difficulty talking about anything with their student. And Sometimes many, many parents tell me that the moment that they sit down to help their, their student with math, it results in a huge fight and ends up you, words such as, I hate you, you're useless, go away, are often uttered. And so I think that before we begin to talk about strategies for dealing with test anxiety, we do have to address how to talk to your student about test anxiety. And luckily there's some really simple approaches that work. And I believe it's totally possible for a parent to support their own teen with learning and with anxiety in using some simple strategies. So number one, modeling. As you may know, children learn through modeling, teens learn through modeling. This is often the first feedback that I give parents is that if your student is struggling with anything, it's really important to look at yourself first. Your child is so incredibly sensitive to what you're feeling and what you're going through. And children and teens learn by watching the people around them. Mimicry is just a huge part of learning. That's why you want your student to have inspiring mentors. But I just, there's, this is just an incredible, incredible way students learn. So what I would say is just, first of all, take a moment and ask yourself, how are you navigating anxiety in your own life? 
Um, are you feeling particularly anxious right now about work um, or just a general kind of anxiety? How are you dealing with that yourself before you go and try to advise your teen about their anxiety? And then separately, what are your fears for your student and their feet in their future? Are you scared about how they're going to do on the SAT? Are you scared about how they're going to perform on their next French or math exam? Are you afraid about what's going to happen if they fail math? Um, are you afraid they're not going to get a good job or get into a good college? I think I've seen CEOs of major corporations completely terrified and in tears, um, worrying about the SAT. And I think it's just really important to acknowledge that because there is no way you are going to hide anything from your team. They are just too smart and they will pick up on everything that you're feeling. So start there. And hopefully some of the strategies we talk about that will help your teen for dealing with anxiety are also things that you can apply to your own life. So one thing I think is great, for example, is if you can kind of highlight specific examples of how you're navigating your own anxiety in your own life. And um, kind, not with the intention of fixing your teen, but with just noting, noting, noting. So you make this decision that you're gonna deal with your own anxiety. And let's say you have a big presentation coming up at work. Maybe if you're a family that has dinner together, you might simply say, wow, I had a presentation today. I was really nervous about it. And then I stepped away and I meditated for five minutes and I came back and that helped me really do a good job at my presentation and I was really excited about how it went. Or perhaps you might have a situation where you, um, it might be something different. You might say, wow, I was really, really um, upset because you know my boss yelled at me today, but then you know I realized that he's going through a hard time and it wasn't about me, something of that nature. So they can see techniques or, you know, hey, I ate a salad today instead of potato chips. I felt so much better the whole day. So if you can note those things and try not to do it in a manipulative way, um, I think your teen really will pick up on it and they'll be inspired to apply some of those techniques to their own life. So modeling, 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 you know, self-care kind of sounds a little bit wishy-washy to people, but it's incredibly effective. I mean, when parents overcome their anxiety, children overcome their anxiety. So that's foundational. So once you've uh, mastered that part, <laughs> um, we can talk about communication. One thing I often see is that when a teen says, I'm so stressed, I'm so anxious, parent will jump in and try to fix it and say, oh, honey, that's okay. Oh, you know, the SAT doesn't matter. We don't care about that. You're going to be fine. Oh, it doesn't matter what college you go to. You know, some parents, you know, are a little bit stricter. <laughs> They'll go on the opposite side of things. But, you know, I think what, what the best possible thing you can say, if you take anything away from this presentation, is if your teen is upset, if they're anxious, just say, that stinks. Listen to them. I'm so sorry. That's horrible you feel that way. That's an awful thing to feel. Just take a moment to be with them and digest what they're feeling because there's nothing more soothing than being heard. And when their emotions are validated, that will help them pass through. So whenever I work with a student who has test anxiety, the first thing I say is, that sucks. It's so frustrating. You know, I can't imagine what it's like to have studied so hard and then forget everything when you're about to do your dictate. That is just awful. And that's it. You can also reflect what you hear. Um, you know, again, this is sometimes this tool takes practice and um, you don't want to look like you're trying too hard, but just, you know, say like, oh, I'm so stressed about my test. I hear that you're really stressed. Just really take a moment, take a pause to hear them. And then you can get curious about what they're feeling. And, and rather than trying to fix it, and it's so, so hard because we're so attached to our children. We just want to make them feel good. And it hurts so much when they feel bad. But the more you can be really curious about what they're feeling and try to understand it and ask, like, do, you know, do I understand? 
Okay, then and only then you can go to the next step, say like, can I be of support? I have, I've experienced some anxiety in my own life and learned some techniques that have worked for me. Would you like to hear some? And if they say no, then you just don't say anything. All right, well, I'm here for you. I'm really sorry you're feeling this way, period. And I do believe if you ask them if they can be of support, they will come back to you. And it's when they open the door that then you can bring some strategies again. So again, if there's anything you take from this, it's really simple, but if your teen is upset, all you just say is, that stinks. I'm so sorry. Okay, so then your teen comes to you and says, mom, dad, I do want your help. Please give me a technique. So I usually say, don't try to overload them with different techniques. Even with the students I work with, I maybe give them one new technique every two weeks. Really start simple. You can experiment with different stuff. So there's kind of a couple categories of ways to deal with anxiety. Very physical ways to deal with it. And I found for myself that the physical practices often help the most. Um, and then there are more psychological practices. And again, I want to reiterate, I am not a nutritionist. I am not a therapist. I'm just someone who's tried a bunch of stuff and read a bunch of blogs and seen things that work for myself and the students that I work with. So, you know, we have a temptation to say, just take a deep breath. Frankly, that doesn't work for me. I don't never in my life really have I told a team, please just breathe. And that's worked for them, I think. It just, um, for some reason, I mean, maybe people used to not know that they had to breathe, but now for some reason, just saying, oh, just take a deep breath. It's like, I've tried that, that doesn't work. So, so we're gonna try some other things. But obviously breathing deeply is a wonderful tool, but um, I just found with these teens, sometimes they're gonna really jump quickly and say, deep breathing doesn't work for me. So first of all, favorite acronym, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. I know that your students are getting so much homework and having so many exams, um, but I do believe that you are at a school that really supports their learning and their development. So if your teen is not getting enough sleep, if they're not, you know, exercising or not making it, you know, enough friends, you can work with the school to support them in this. I think that if your teen is so tired because they're doing seven hours of homework a night and staying up till 2 a.m., you can talk to the teachers at your school and say, you know, this is too much for my student to excel. And you can encourage them to do the same. It's really important that they learn how to negotiate. And if they come from a place of saying, this is what I need in order to excel and to learn the material, can you, put my assignment off to, you know, can I have the deadline later? Then um, that's a really good life skill to learn. Um, so, you know, really the more that you can kind of gently encourage your team to advocate, the better. And you can emphasize these are great tools for a future CEO, for a woman in business. You, it's just something that you will have to learn to advocate for yourself. So they might as well start now. And a good way to start is if, you know, they're getting too much homework and not getting enough sleep. Um, nice, another little tip, very easy. This is an easier one. Maybe you don't even have to talk to them, but just having a nice little lavender bag that they can bring around with them and smell um, is a really sweet thing to have to kind of just relax them. I also sometimes like touching a silky piece of fabric that can be very soothing. And even just the knowledge that lavender helps relax you would just is a nice thing. Um, there's a, I really like binaural beats. I think there's some scientific controversy about how it works, but I think that especially, um, my mother is actually a pre-med advisor and students who struggle with the MCAT, she has them listen on headphones to these binaural beats. I really like the Equisync one so they can listen to that while they do their homework and it just can really help balance them out and focus them. I like Mozart as well. And then, you know, you can go even further and have gong baths and sound healing, but that stuff is really powerful. And then I'll say the thing that works for me the most is a focus on nutrition. And I do want to emphasize again, I am not a nutritionist, I am not a doctor, but I will say that 
one point in my 20s, I was in Brooklyn and I was probably going nine to 12 hours a week to a meditation center and practicing yoga and seeing a therapist. And I still had this kind of low level anxiety all the time. And um, I was also an actress at the time who was tutoring. And so I was doing just like all kinds of different diets and ridiculousness. Um, and so I, I learned actually that I, I did this kind of cleanse and I and, and was mostly eating green vegetables and high in fat and my anxiety was gone. And every time I get really stressed out, even today, if I'm, you know, often it's, I'm sleep deprived, but it really does keep coming back to nutrition. And so nutrition is delicate because everybody is different and every food affects people differently. So my body is different. Your child's body is different. Your body is different, but I will, I do think you might find that and they might find that what they eat can make a huge impact on their anxiety. So for me, this is what I found. I mean, lots of dark leafy greens, kale, broccoli, that good stuff, and lots of healthy fat, avocado, olive oil. I love tahini. Um, I find for myself that <laughs> this peanut butter is just a cure-all. And if you're especially if your teen might have trouble keeping on weight, just having a little jar of peanut butter in their locker can be nice. I don't know if that's even allowed. Eggs, um, sometimes I take vitamin B12, calcium, magnesium. I'm being a little cautious here because I, again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not sure about uh, the effect of CBD on teens, but that, that's been helpful for me too. And then things that tend to really stress me out sugar, obviously, um, caffeine, those are kind of obvious. I hope your teen isn't drinking alcohol, but that can be a big stressor, especially if you're trying to look at some of the ways that you get anxious and model getting calm, that can be a good one to cut out. And then gluten and, you know, I know how everyone eats is so personal to them, but you know, these things on the right can be inflammatory and it's just, it can be just extraordinary to see what a difference these things can make all these psychological ideas kind of disappear when you're getting enough sleep and eating healthy. So if your teen is open to eating some big healthy salads with lots of great healthy fats, I really encourage that. So, okay, so those physical things, and now I'll get to the psychological. So again, I, I you know suggest introducing these slowly but um, when I was an actress, my acting teachers used to love to tell this story about a young actor who approached the great Laurence Olivier, who was the, considered the greatest actor of his time, and said, brag to him, I never get stage fright. And Laurence Olivier kind of laughed, scoffed, looked down at him and said, don't worry, that comes with talent. So the first thing I tell my teens is that you know, anxiety is not necessarily a bad thing. You might, anxiety can give you adrenaline. Maybe you're, you know, really, really great at something and you're anxious because you're excited to, to show what you know. What is for sure is that if you fight the anxiety, it will just get worse. So what I suggest to my students is the next time you take a test and you start to feel that anxiety and then you start to think, oh my gosh, I'm ruined, all my hard work is going away, then you can just say, okay, what happens if I just look at my anxiety and say, welcome, welcome anxiety, you're here, so I'm just going to try to take the test with you here and see what happens. That can be really, really powerful, and I think we all can acknowledge that there are a lot of things to be anxious and upset about in the world. There's, you know, global pandemic, a war in Ukraine, fighting all over the world. There's so much stress just being a young person at school. And rather than say, oh, don't be anxious about that, see if you can welcome that anxiety. And one thing that I often like to do is a body exercise where you just try to, you know, talk to your teen about what is this that you're feeling in your body, the anxiety? What, what shape is it? What color is it? Just kind of look at it in an objective way instead of, instead of fighting against it. 
So that's a big one. And then strong preparation. So I, um, you know, I realized that as this presentation was about to happen, I was starting to be a little bit anxious about giving it to you. And a great cure for, you know, that is being prepared. And sometimes a teacher does not tell you all the information that's going to be on an exam and things pop up on the exam that you didn't expect. However, if you can go to that teacher with a list of things that you're expecting to see on the exam and make sure that you have everything, then you're going to be better prepared for the exam. So I really encourage students, again, ask questions, make sure that you're fully aware of what's on the exam. Um, preparation does alleviate anxiety. And if your student needs help getting better organized, you know, in order to be really prepared for their exams, then do that. Same with the SAT or SSAT, just be prepared. And then, um, and, and then again, advocacy. So if you, um, are trying to get ready for an exam or hand in a paper and you just have too much to do, that's okay. You can talk to your teacher. You can ask for an extension. You can say, is this reasonable? And again, you're lucky you go to a school that really wants to support your students learning. So that's a good tool to develop in your student, asking for what they need in order to excel and realizing that's okay. So after your student is fully prepared, um, I find something that comes up a lot is that students second guess themselves. So they know the answer to the question, they doubt themselves, they don't put down what they know and instead they put down something else that's not correct. So really good cure for second guessing is I just tell a student, fail fast. You know, you know that pretty much all the time when you change your answer, you get it wrong. So how about just as an experiment, Next time you trust your intuition and see what happens. Um, the worst that's going to happen is you realize that your intuition was wrong and then you're going to learn what the correct answer is. Um, but if you second guess yourself, you're going to learn nothing. You're not going to learn that you have good intuition or anything. You're not going to learn if you prepared well or not. And we use this phrase in startups all the time. Fail fast, fail fast. Prepare as much as you can and this just go in and fail practice guessing your first choice. And that's the only way you're gonna know if you know the information or not. It's a really important skill. So I am really am a fan of dialectical behavioral therapy and there's two exercises I really like a lot, um, you might've heard of them. Um, so they're mindfulness exercises. So if a student starts feeling really anxious, one thing that can be very grounding is to just stop and say like what are five things I see what are four things I hear what are three things I smell two things I taste one thing I touch it's just a really good grounding exercise sometimes I do it um, when I'm having trouble listening to someone and I feel like I need to jump in and say something and I can't control myself I I do this exercise that really helps me another one is to um, freeze every muscle in your body. Just stop and just freeze. Um, and then there's actually a third one I like a lot, which is just to dump your whole uh, face in water. It kind of just uh, jolts the nervous system, can be really effective. I know this is a ton of information to, to throw at you, um, but I think kind of just to summarize, like really as much as you can encourage them to welcome their anxiety and to start to get comfortable with failure and realize that failure is the best way to learn because it's experiential. And when you experience things, you, you learn very quickly. This is, I'm currently working with a student and this is how she second guesses her, herself a lot. And uh, I've just said like experiment on one problem, guessing your first guess, and that's how you'll learn. It's been working really well for her. So, okay, as I said before, don't, let, in contrast to what I'm doing to you right now, um, don't try to implement more than one thing every two weeks. Change is very hard. It's hard to change yourself psychologically. So maybe you might decide you're just going to talk to them about welcoming the anxiety, or you're just going to talk to them about 
eating less sugar or eating more greens. It's always better to go for more than less. Um, and then that can, you can kind of do a positive reinforcement with that. Um, so yeah, and experiment, you know, some, you know, for me, freezing every muscle in my body works great. For other people, it's not going to work at all. Same with, um, you know, some people just do really great with a lot of rice and carbs and other people are going to uh, really see a change when they start eating more healthy fats. So just, you know, just encourage your team to try stuff and see what works. Nothing is a be all and end all solution. You know, maybe, you know, one strategy might be let's, let's, you know, you have seven hours of homework tonight, you need your sleep. Let's just see what happens if you email one teacher and ask for an extension and say, you really want to do well in class. Can you have it? Or sometimes it'll be even more simple. I, I'll encourage a student to say like, is there something that you can ask for that you know the person is going to say no to. So you can just practice what it feels like for someone to say no when you try to ask for something like, can I borrow your headband? Just experiment. And that can be fun. So thank you. So I just, I that's pretty much, I know I just threw a ton of information at you and you probably would love clarification. I'd also really love to talk to you individually about any issues that you might be experiencing. Um, you can just ask me a question or you can put your question in the chat if you feel more comfortable and um, we can go from there. And then I'll also, these are some of the resources I mentioned. The Equisync Binaural Beats, how to, oh, this is a great book about how to talk to your teens, but, uh, how to talk so teens will listen and, listen so teens will talk. They also wrote how to talk so kids can learn. And I give these books to all my teachers and they're just so incredibly effective. The, the difference when you start saying that stinks to your student versus it's gonna be okay, honey, is, is night and day, I, I promise you. So yeah, so that's pretty much all I have to say in the presentation part. And I would love to hear your questions. Does anyone have any questions or want to troubleshoot a particular situation you're experiencing now? I would, I would love to hear what people are most uh, struggling with. Okay, great, Victoria. Sometimes in the middle of a test, a student will break down and not want to finish. Okay, so what are set techniques that you found that can help nudge them along? So again, I think, I mean, I would imagine that for this to happen to a student, for them to feel this overwhelmed would be shameful for them and really overwhelming. So. I would say that probably the first step is to let them really take a break and just say, just come over. And again, the first step is to notice what's happening. I see that you are really upset. I know that you are capable. Why don't we just take a little break? And then when you're ready, you can get back to the exam. So you maybe you can have them kind of sit in a different spot in the room and just just be present with them and let them experience what they're experiencing get them some water and eventually these emotions are going to flow through them but i think for them to take that moment where they can step away from the test and regroup is really important and then just saying like this test is really hard it can feel overwhelming let's just take a little break are you feeling better? I know you can do this. I know you have this material. You ready to try again? You need a little more time? So just really acknowledging what's happening for them and letting them experience before you, you start that nudge. I am more nervous than my son about tests. 
what do you think about me making him more nervous best approach? Well, that is a great question. So I would love to have a dialogue with you about this. Um, we can right now or later, but I would really encourage you to think about the source of your anxiety. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if you are feeling nervous, that's definitely going to make him more nervous. So I think that it really helps to be very concrete about what you're scared about. There's a really wonderful I think spiritual teacher named Byron Katie, and she kind of takes deep people down a path where they say like, I'm really nervous that my son is gonna fail this test or what's gonna happen if he fails that test? Well, he's not gonna get into college. Well, what's gonna happen if he's not gonna get into college? Well, he's not gonna be able to get a job. And with each step you can say, is that true? Is that true? And, you know, perhaps for example, if he does really poorly on the test, he might not get into an Ivy League school. And if he might not get into an Ivy League school, it could be a lot more difficult for him to become a banker because they tend to look at what you, um, you know, what kind of school you go to if you're a banker. Other professions, not so much. I think if you're going to be an engineer, you might not even need that. So I think that really, um, Michael, I think I would have to ask you some more questions, but you know, you might want to really think about what, what specifically are you nervous about? And is the kind of nervousness where there's like something very specific and concrete that you're worried is going to happen if he doesn't do well on his test? Um, or is it really more you just feeling anxious um, in your own life and just kind of channeling this into tests? So in terms of your own anxiety, I think the same techniques that I would suggest for the student, think about your nutrition, you know, meditation, get therapy, go to yoga, find, find a thing that works for you because that will definitely impact your son, how you're feeling. I hope that's helpful. I'm happy to have a longer conversation about it so I can get a little more detailed about what, what specifically you're scared about. My son is listening to music when learning. Is it interfering with his learning? Would binaural music be better for him? Um, I think it depends on him and it depends on what he's listening to. If you see that he is really concentrated while he's listening to music, then I think probably that music is working great for him. I think that for me, I've found there are a couple of things that help me study Mozart, listening to classical music, and the binaural beats are amazing. You know, if you can just get him to do that a couple of times, I think it would be great for him. Um, but I think that if he is listening to the music and it's helping him study, then by all means, that's a good thing. If he's doing, you know, if, if that's a tool he's found to help him focus, then, then that's terrific. If he's kind of distracted and all over the place, maybe not so much. Yeah, so back to this question about the dad being worried about his son, the dad is concerned he won't do well and then will lose all of his confidence. So that is, that's really deep. Um, and I would wonder, Michael, you know, if you feel like, you know, he has, there's a kind of um, disconnect that he's not trying his hardest and then he's not doing well. And so, have you observed him not doing well and then losing confidence in the past? Um, what, what's, what's the outcome of losing his confidence? Are you, are you able to let him fail? Are you able to let him fail and see what happens when he loses his confidence? Because ultimately it's a question about alignment. Like, is he preparing and doing his best and then not succeeding on this test? Or is he under preparing and not doing well on the test? And Confidence, I think, is really about um, being in, in, in integrity about your what you are capable of doing and what your limitations are. And the more you can be specific and concrete about that with him, the more confidence he'll have. It's a little bit tricky, you know, since I don't know your particular situation, but I, I imagine that 
you know, you might think a little bit about times in your life that you don't have confidence and, and how you have dealt with that. What does confidence mean to you? What it's meant in your life? And how do you work in your own life to build your confidence? So he's very confident um, and you'd like him to remain so. So, I mean, if he, you know, then another thing too, is you can kind of poke fun at yourself if um, you are, you know, worried, if you have seen him not doing well and he's kind of overconfident, I think that's something that you might want to look at. Um, but, you know, if you see that he's confident and then he's doing well and you still have this fear about him losing confidence, it sounds a little bit like you might be projecting some of your own fears onto him since you haven't actually witnessed him losing confidence. And I think that there's a lot of tools that you can work with that can help you with that. Um, I think, you know, finding, everybody goes to therapy nowadays. I think there's a lot of really great um, teachers who write about this topic. Um, but I think that, you know, knowing that somewhere down the road, he might start to lose confidence when he sees your lack of confidence can provide you extra motivation to take better care of yourself. I, I mean, I know that in my own life, my lack of confidence often comes from feeling like I've worked really hard and I'm not getting the same results as other people. Um, but you might want to look at kind of where where that is for you and how you know how you can take care of yourself and develop that in yourself. I think it is really important for you and for your family. I think sometimes we also have a lack of confidence around things that society thinks are important, like you know, having a great marriage or having getting that promotion at work or having a big salary and, you know, kind of looking inward and saying, well, what is really important to me and how am I succeeding at that is some way that you can build confidence and knowing we're not, no one's really better than anyone else or worse than anyone else. It's what each of us brings to this life. So conflicts between teachers and students are difficult and possibly make the kid hate the subject. Do you have any advice on that? Wow, that's a great question. I think that it really depends on the teacher. What, what's tricky is that sometimes kids are trying to exert control. Um, sometimes the teacher is actually asking things of them that might not be fair. And it's really frustrating or the kid might be bored and not enjoy what they're learning, not see the value in it. So. I think that often it's really important to address these and sometimes you can talk to the principal of the school and, or suggest that you have a meeting all together but it's um it's really important that you know both people understand what's going on and I think be concrete with your student about their goals like okay so you hate this teacher you hate this subject you think they did something unfair um, what are some ways that you can talk to this teacher about it in a way where you can actually get what you want? Well, probably by understanding their point of view first, you're more likely to influence them than by being obnoxious and yelling at them. So what is the outcome that you're hoping for? And then secondly, like, what is your big, you know, what is your big outcome? You, you know, do you want to get a good grade in this class or do you want to prove a point? And you know, relative to what they want to do in life in terms of getting into a good school, you know, they can really think through what, what their own values and the situation are. But communication is a whole big topic, but I think that helping your child get specific about what bothers them and the change that they want to see and strategies to actually make an impact in the dynamic of what's going on is important. And there are reasons to learn a subject that you don't like. And sometimes you just really don't wanna learn it at all. And maybe there might be an option to, to switch. So it's good to explore that from all angles. Our son seems to be very confident, never stressed about anything. Do you think it'd be a way for him to hide his real feelings and anxiety over playing confidence? Well, I think that you know your son better than I do. So some kids are just more confident and I think that's fantastic. 
um, I think you just need to look concretely about is his confidence interfering in his ability to do well at school? I mean, is he just kind of very content to get C's or B's and not really do better at life? Then, you know, there can be kind of a stagnation um, where, you know, confidence is maybe masking some kind of deeper fear, some kind of almost like a lack, you feel like there's almost like a lackluster or a dullness about it. Um, it, it suggests there might be like some kind of energy in him that's a little bit tamped down. Um, I would say just, you know, really, again, it kind of comes back to the same thing, like really deep listening, seeing how he's feeling, connecting. And if you feel like you are able to connect with him good and you feel like there's a disconnect, then that's something to look about. Um, a lot of students are struggling with motivation during the pandemic. Can we speak a bit about how we can help support them and find the self-motivation necessary for academic success? Oof, so this is a really big topic. Um, so, <laughs> you know, coming this, this whole workshop about test anxiety is really focused on these kind of super motivated kids who are self-sabotaging themselves because they get so stressed about tests. And this is the flip side of that where the type of kid that you might consider lazy. And I really believe that no student is lazy. Sometimes when you see laziness, it's actually that students are depressed it makes sense that students would be feeling unhappy with everything that's been going on in the world. And I think I would really encourage you to seek therapy if your student is unhappy. There are people who are you know, so gifted at working with kids. And I think that if there is a lack of motivation, it might be kind of masking some depression. I think that you know, a lot of screen time has been hard. The more you can get kids outside to play with friends, is really important. Um, but then I think a lot of times we kind of throw homework and tests on kids without really explaining well why these tests are important. Or, you know, so on one hand, like they might have so much homework and so many tests, they don't even have a moment to stop and be inspired by what their teachers are talking about and get engaged in conversation, which is really sad. Um, so I think definitely, I mean, I'm always a fan of reducing homework in any way and just having the learning happen in the classroom. But I also feel like we owe it to our children to very rationally explain to them why they're doing what they're doing instead of just having them do it because I said so. So even a two-year-old, I will speak very, very rationally about why a behavior is not working for me. Or, you know, I think that with our, with our teens, we really have to say, okay, why is it important that you do well in algebra, even though you wanna be an actress and are never gonna use algebra? And if you don't know why, then you should really think about it before you tell your student it's important. Or why do they have to go to college? And we see, you know, a lot of people are talking about college being phased out. So um, we can really, you know, we can really step back and think about why specifically it's, you feel it's important for them to get good grades and get their feedback on your thoughts around it and let them ask why as much as they want, have a real conversation about it. Um, you know, they are going to a really incredible school. A lot of people have go to schools that are not so great you know, you might want to talk about how for you, you were working really hard and you really wanted to put them in a school that where they would thrive and it's an expensive experience for you. And, you know, if you feel sad when you feel like they're not working as they as hard as they could, and then they might have some interesting perspective on that. I, I work with some families whose um, kids have decided to homeschool because they just really thought that what they were learning in school was useless. And that's not the case here, but it is the case in some other schools. And so, you know, really, you know, really talk to them and get to the bottom of, of why this is important. And you might need to clarify it for yourself as well. 
our son is just incapable of planning works, which increases our anxiety so much, especially in the weeks before a major exam. But he is fine with following the schedule we pre prepared for him. And the idea is to motivate him working on his own schedule instead of working always at the last minute. We'd like him to make him more autonomous. We fear he might not be able to work by his own way in college and far from home. So for this one, I would say when you're making, it's first of all, it's fantastic that he is following the schedule that you make. A lot of kids wouldn't do that at all. And I think that you need to prepare it with him. So the first step is when you, you can say, all right, it's schedule planning time and you sit down with him and you share your thoughts, you ask for his contributions, you do not just hand him the schedule. And I think that will start, help him start to develop executive functioning skills. The other thing is that we're so afraid for our kids to fail, but sometimes it's really the best thing for them to fail and see the consequences of not, of not planning well. So back to this question of motivation, I think this really is a question of mental health and just recognizing every student right now is struggling, they're depressed, they're sad, they're anxious, we're all coming out of this pandemic. So anything that you would use to deal with your students' depression, like listening to them, reflecting their feelings, healthy food, outdoor time, family time, these are all ways that they can start to feel happy. And I think when they start to feel happy, they're gonna to start to feel more motivated in school as well. And really, really watching screen time as much as you can. Um, I, I, it's hard to change policies around screen time, but I would say one thing you can do is say, you know, during the pandemic, this was our policy on screen time, but now we've been reading some research about how screen time can result in anxiety. And we've noticed that you haven't been motivated in school. So our policy is changing. We know that what we said before is different than what we're saying now. And there might be a lot of frustration and sadness and anger, but just remember that boundaries are love. Anything else? So I've been making a lot of generic statements and I want to emphasize that a lot of these situations are really nuanced, especially around this question of communication with teachers and that lack of motivation. And so um, I really encourage you to follow up and talk to me individually about your situation. I'm going to put my email here in the chat and I'm really, really happy to talk to anyone. We can I'll do, we do, a, when I talk to parents, I do really do a deep dive into what specifically is going on and I can kind of help pinpoint what the issue is. But I think, you know, we're about to go into summer, giving your kids a lot of space, knowing that, you know, everyone in the country is kind of dealing with the same thing. So they need a period to kind of detox and get back into things. Um, it's been really hard and you can have compassion for that. I will say, so but back, back in the day in New York City, I, I worked with a kid who everyone called lazy all the time, one of my favorite students. And we would just, we were preparing for this entrance exam to, um, entrance exam to, to high school, the SSAT. And it was constantly, his mom was constantly being like, oh, this kid's lazy, this kid's lazy, just putting this label on him. And I would just go and sit with the kid for an hour and we would do SSAT vocab and I would just make every word into like a joke about farts and he had had a grand time we laughed together and I I just totally denied this statement of oh he's lazy we were just there together preparing for this exam and he ended up he when we started he was getting a 10 percent and then when he took the test he got in the 90th percentile for the exam and I think that that really boosted his confidence and made him more motivated to see how well he did. So preparation is great and it's important and also just really, really trusting your child's innate drive to learn and to get what they want out of life. It is there, it's a fire in them and trusting in that 
is really important. No kid is, is lazy. All right, any, any clarifications, anything that was unclear or that you disagree with? A lot of these statements are really broad, so I welcome challenging. <laughs> Oh, thanks very much, Venetia. It's reassuring to hear the problem is mine, not his, seriously. Well, I think that you are an amazing parent to have that level of self-awareness. And it's beautiful that you can recognize your son's confidence and see that you have something um, that you need to work on. And I think that knowing that your self-care will have such a great benefit for your son in the short and long term can provide extra motivation because sometimes the hardest person to bring compassion to is ourselves. And uh, yes, I'd be happy to share the books again. And then I would also just say, I think that does um, even relate to motivation. I mean, I think a lot of us are kind of feeling demotivated um, in our work post the pandemic. And we can kind of look at our lack of motivation and ways that we motivate ourselves and talk about it. Talk to your students about their hopes and dreams. Talk about your own hopes and dreams. Think about ways that you motivate yourself. Talk about that. And also give yourself a break because I think we all need a little bit of rest. The books that I recommended was uh, these ones. So this, uh, so we got the Equisync and then how to talk so teens will listen and listen so teens will talk, how to talk so kids can learn. And then our website, Tutora, um, www.tutora.love. And we have incredibly wonderful tutors. They've trained and handpicked myself. They're all really knowledgeable about whole child development. So I fundamentally believe after, and, and I will tell you, I was really good bumping up those SAT scores, but it's really impossible to do if you can't, tap into a student's intrinsic motivation. Um, sometimes just having a student do well on one exam is gonna boost their confidence. And you can kind of, um, I just see that again and again. So all of our tutors really bring a whole child approach and are trying to give kids not just the tools to succeed on one test, but to figure out what they want out of life and how to develop the grit when things get hard, how to have a growth mindset and, and really be fully integrated human beings, but also ace that next test because that's a really important part of it. That's, that's part of how you build trust and motivate them to see, wow, this work I did preparing for this exam resulted in a good grade. And you really, you know, actionable feedback. So let me just see if I can copy and paste these little links for you. And on our website, you can book a learning consult with me, complimentary. And I always love talking to parents and being of support. And I think we recorded this workshop, so I'll send that to you all as well. Here's the links. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I, I really am so grateful that we got such a big turnout and know that everyone is really busy. And I, I love this school. It's been so wonderful collaborating with the team and all the parents I've met have been so great. It's, it's just really nice and refreshing to see a place where kids are challenged, but also there's great value placed on the love of learning and supporting the child's whole development. So I feel really honored to collaborate with you and happy for you that your kids get to be in such a great place. I will add one thing since we talked about this idea of kind of lacklusterness and lack of motivation. One thing that we found really helpful for boosting mental health is volunteer work. And right now, post pandemic, there's a lot of opportunities to do volunteer tutoring for kids in needs. You can, you know, if your student wants to work in a kitchen where they serve food. I think that that um, any kind of service work is, is really, really positive for mental health. And you can do that with your student as well. You know, this um, nonprofit I started during the pandemic just saved my life. It was the only way that I personally could deal with everything that was going on. So 
I definitely encourage that if you can get your kids involved in some volunteer work. I know they're already pretty busy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I hope that all of you have a wonderful evening. If any of you want to stay in chat, I, I'm happy to stay on as well. So, bonne soirée and merci beaucoup.